Uh, we're here today to announce uh, the first uh, synthetic cell. A cell made by uh, starting with the digital code in the computer, uh, building the chromosome uh, from four bottles of chemicals, uh, assembling that chromosome in yeast, transplanting it uh, into a recipient bacterial cell and transforming that cell into a new bacterial species. So uh, this is the first self-replicating species that we've had on the planet whose parent is a computer. Uh, it also is the first uh, species to have its own website encoded in its genetic code. Uh, but we'll talk uh, more about the uh, watermarks in a minute. This is a project that had its inception 15 years ago. Uh, when our team uh, then, uh, we called the Institute Tiger, uh, were involved in sequencing the first two genomes in history. We did uh, Haemophilus influenzae and then uh, the smallest genome of a self-replicating organism, that of Mycoplasma genitalium. And as soon as uh, we had these two sequences, uh, we thought if this is supposed to be the smallest genome of a self-replicating species, could there be even a smaller genome? Could we understand the basis of cellular life at the genetic level? Uh, it's been a 15-year quest just to get to the starting point now to be able to answer those questions. Because it's very difficult to eliminate uh, multiple genes from a cell, you can only do them one at a time, we decided early on that we had to take a synthetic route, even though nobody had been there before, to see if we could synthesize the bacterial chromosome so we could actually vary the gene content to understand the essential genes for life. Uh, that started a, our 15-year quest uh, to get here. Before we did the first experiments, uh, we actually asked uh, Art Kaplan's team, uh, then at the University of Pennsylvania, to undertake a review of whether uh, what the risks, the challenges, the ethics around creating new uh, species in the laboratory were, because it hadn't been done before. They spent about two years uh, reviewing that uh, independently and published their results in Science in 1999. Ham and I took a, a two years off as a side project to sequence the human genome, but as soon as that was done, uh, we got back uh, to the task at hand. Uh, in 2002, we started a new institute, uh, the Institute for Biological Energy Alternatives, where we set out uh, two goals. One, to understand uh, the impact of our technology on the environment and, and how to understand the environment better. And two, to start down this process of uh, making uh, synthetic life to understand basic life. In 2003, uh, we published our first success. So Ham Smith and Clyde Hutchinson developed some new methods uh, for making error-free DNA at a small level. Our first task was a 5,000-letter code bacteriophage, a virus that attacks only E. coli. So that was uh, the, uh, the phage Phi X174 which was chosen for historical reasons. It was the first uh, DNA phage, uh, DNA virus, uh, DNA genome that was actually sequenced. Uh, so once we realized that we could make uh, 5,000 base pair viral size pieces, we thought we at least had the means then to try and make serially lots of these pieces to be able to eventually assemble them together uh, to make uh, this megabase uh, chromosome. Uh, so substantially larger than we even thought we would go after uh, initially. Uh, so there were several steps to this. There were two sides. We had to solve the chemistry for making large DNA molecules, and we had to solve the biological side of how, if we had this new chemical entity, how would we boot it up, activate it uh, in a recipient cell. So we had two teams working in parallel, uh, one team on the chemistry and the other uh, on trying to uh, be able to transplant entire chromosomes uh, to get new cells. Uh, when we started this out, we thought the synthesis would be the biggest problem, which is why we chose the smallest genome. And some of you have noticed that we switched from the smallest genome to a much uh, larger one. 
uh, and we can walk through the reasons for that, but basically the, the small uh, cell uh, took uh, on the order of uh, one to two months to get results from, whereas the larger, faster growing cell uh, takes only two days. So there's only so many cycles we could go through uh, in a year at six weeks per cycle. And you should know that uh, basically 99, probably 99% plus of our experiments uh, failed. So this was a debugging, problem-solving scenario from the beginning because there was no recipe uh, of how to get there. So uh, one of the most important publications we had was in 2007. Uh, Carol Ortigue uh, led the effort to actually transplant a bacterial chromosome from one bacteria to another. I think philosophically that was one of the most important papers uh, that we've ever uh, done because it showed how dynamic life was. And we knew once that worked that we actually had a chance uh, if we could make the synthetic chromosomes to do the same uh, with those. Uh, we didn't know that it was gonna take us several years uh, more uh, to get there. Uh, in 2008, we reported the complete synthesis of the mycoplasma genitalium genome, a little over 500,000 letters of genetic code. But we have not yet succeeded in booting up that chromosome. We think in part of its, its slow growth, uh, and in part uh, cells have all kinds of unique defense mechanisms to keep these events from happening. It turned out the cell that we were trying to transplant into had a nuclease, an enzyme that chews up DNA on its surface and was happy to eat the uh, synthetic DNA that we gave it and never got transplantations. Uh, but at the time, uh, that was the largest uh, molecule of a defined structure that had been made. And so both sides were progressing, but part of the synthesis uh, had to be accomplished or was able to be accomplished using yeast putting the fragments in yeast, and yeast would assemble these for us. Uh, it's an amazing uh, step forward. But we had a problem because now we had the bacterial chromosomes growing in yeast. So in addition to doing the transplant, we had to find out how to get a bacterial chromosome out of the eukaryotic yeast into a form where we could transplant it into a recipient cell. So, our team developed new techniques for actually growing, cloning entire bacterial chromosomes in yeast. So we took the same mycoides <coughs> genome uh, that Carol had initially transplanted and we grew that in yeast as an artificial chromosome. And we thought this would be a great test bed for learning how to get chromosomes out of yeast and transplant them. When we did these experiments though, we could get the chromosome out of yeast but it wouldn't transplant and boot up a cell. Uh, that little issue took the team two years to solve. It turns out the DNA in the bacterial cell was actually methylated, and the methylation protects it from the restriction enzyme uh, from digesting the DNA. So what we found is if we took the chromosome out of yeast and methylated it, we could then transplant it. Uh, further advances came when the team removed the restriction enzyme genes from the recipient Capricolum cell and once we've done that, now we can take naked DNA out of yeast and transplant it. So uh, last fall, when we published the results of that work uh, in science, uh, we all became overconfident and we're sure we we're only uh, a few weeks away uh, from being able to now boot up uh, a chromosome out of yeast. Uh, because of the problems uh, with uh, a mycoplasma genitalium and its slow growth, about a year and a half ago, uh, we decided to synthesize the much larger chromosome, the mycoides chromosome, uh, knowing that we had the biology worked out on that for transplantation. Uh, and Dan led the team for uh, the synthesis of this over one million base pair chromosome. Uh, but it turned out it wasn't going to be as simple in the end, and it sent us back three months because we had one error out of over a million base pairs in that sequence. So the team developed new debugging software we could, where we could test each synthetic fragment to see if it would grow in a background of uh, a wild-type uh, DNA. And we found that 10 out of the 11 100,000 base pair pieces we synthesized were completely accurate and, and compatible with a, uh, a life-forming uh, sequence. Uh, we narrowed it down to one fragment, we sequenced it, and found just one base pair had been deleted in an essential gene. So accuracy is essential. 
There's parts of the genome where it cannot tolerate even a single error. And then there's parts of the genome where we can put in large blocks of DNA, as we did with the watermarks, uh, and it can tolerate all kinds of errors. So it took about three months to find that error and uh, repair it. Uh, and then uh, early one morning uh, at 6 a.m., we got a text uh, from Dan saying that now uh, the first blue colonies existed. So it's been a long uh, route to get here, uh, 15 years uh, from the beginning. We felt one of the tenets of this field was to make absolutely certain we could distinguish synthetic DNA uh, from natural DNA. Uh, early on when you're working in a new area of science, you have to think about all the pitfalls and things that could lead you to believe that you had done something when you hadn't, and uh, even worse, uh, leading others to believe it. So uh, we thought the worst problem would be a single molecule contamination of the native chromosome. Uh, leading us to believe that we actually had uh, created a synthetic cell when it would have been just a contaminant. So early on, we developed the notion of putting in watermarks in the DNA to absolutely make clear that the DNA uh, was synthetic. In the first chromosome we uh, built uh, in 2008, uh, the 500,000 uh, base pair one, uh, we simply assigned uh, the names of the authors of the chromosome uh, into the genetic code, but it was using just amino acid uh, single letter translations, which leaves out uh, certain letters of the alphabet. Uh, so the team actually developed a new code within the code within the code. Uh, so it's a new uh, code for interpreting and writing messages in DNA. Now, mathematicians have been hiding and writing messages in the genetic code for a long time, but it's clear they were mathematicians and not biologists, uh, because if you write long messages with the code that the math mathematicians developed, it would more than likely lead to new uh, proteins being synthesized with unknown uh, functions. Uh, so the code that uh, Mike Montague and, and the team developed actually puts frequent stop code on, so it's a different alphabet but allows us to uh, use the entire uh, uh, English alphabet uh, with punctuation and numbers. So there's uh, four major watermarks all over a thousand uh, base pairs of genetic code. The first one actually contains within it this code for interpreting uh, the rest of the genetic code. So um, in the remaining, uh, uh, remaining uh, information in the watermarks contain the names of, I think it's uh, uh, 46 different uh, authors and key contributors uh, to getting the project to this stage. Uh, and we also built in uh, three, uh, a website uh, address so that if somebody decodes the code within the code, within the code, they can send an email to that address. So it's, it's, uh, it's clearly distinguishable from any other species uh, having 46 uh, names in it, uh, its own web address. Uh, and uh, we added uh, three quotations. Uh, because uh, the, with the first genome, we were criticized for not trying to say something more profound than, than just signing the work. So we won't give the, the rest of the code, but we will give the three quotations. So the first is uh, to live, to err, to fall, to triumph, and to recreate life out of life. It's a James Joyce quote. The second quotation is see things not as they are, but as they might be. So it's a quote from the American Prometheus uh, book on Robert Oppenheimer. And the last one is a Richard Feynman quote, uh, what I cannot build, I cannot understand. So we tried to build a little bit of, uh, because this is a much of a philosophical uh, advance as a technical advance in science, uh, we tried to deal with both the philosophical and the technical side. Uh, the last thing I'll say before turning it over questions is the, the extensive work um, that we've done asking for ethical review, uh, pushing the envelope uh, on that side as well as the technical side. 
this has been broadly discussed in the scientific community, in the policy community, uh, and at the highest levels of the federal government. And even with uh, this announcement, as we did in 2003, uh, that work was funded by the Department of Energy, so it, the work was reviewed uh, at the level of the White House, uh, trying to decide whether to classify the work or, or publish it, and uh, they came down on the side of open publication, which is the, the right approach. Uh, we've uh, briefed the White House, uh, we've briefed members of Congress, uh, we've tried to take and push the policy issues uh, in parallel with the scientific advances. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, open it first to the floor uh, for questions. Yes, in the back. Could you explain in layman's terms how significant a breakthrough this is, please? Can we explain how significant this is? I, I, I'm not sure we're the ones that should be explaining how significant it is. It, it's significant to us. It, it, perhaps it's a giant philosophical change in how we view life. We actually view it as a baby step in terms of uh, it's taken us 15 years to now to be able to do the experiment we wanted to do 15 years ago uh, on understanding uh, life at its basic level. Uh, but we, we actually believe this is going to be a very powerful set of tools. Uh, and we're already starting in numerous avenues uh, to use this tool. Uh, we have uh, at the Institute ongoing funding now from NIH uh, in a program uh, with Novartis to try and use these new synthetic DNA tools uh, to perhaps make the uh, flu vaccine that you might get next year because instead of taking weeks to months to make these, uh, Dan's team can now make these in less than 24 hours. So when you see how long it took to get an H1N1 vaccine out, we think we can shorten that process uh, quite substantially. In the vaccine area, so Synthetic Genomics and the, uh, the Institute are forming a new vaccine company because we think these tools can affect vaccines uh, to diseases that haven't been possible to date, things where the viruses rapidly evolve, such with rhinovirus. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to have something that actually block common colds? Uh, or more importantly, HIV, where the virus evolves so quickly, the vaccines that are made uh, today can't uh, keep up with those evolutionary changes. Uh, also at Synthetic Genomics, uh, we've been working uh, on major environmental issues. I think uh, this latest oil spill in the Gulf is a, is a reminder. We can't see CO2, we depend on scientific measurements for it, and we see uh, the beginning results of having too much of it. Uh, but we can see pre-CO2 now floating on the waters and uh, contaminating the beaches in the Gulf. We need some alternatives uh, uh, for oil. Uh, we have a program with ExxonMobil to try and develop new strains of algae that can efficiently capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or from concentrated sources, make new hydrocarbons that can go into their refineries to make normal gasoline and diesel fuel out of CO2. Those are just a couple of the approaches and directions that we're taking.